Hollywood, California, Monday, November 16th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Lily Pons and Adolf Manjou in conversation piece with Marjorie Gateson and George Saunders. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Lily Pons, Adolf Manjou, Marjorie Gateson, and George Saunders. Our guests, Peg Murray, and Cotton Warburton, film editor and former All-American quarterback. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. On behalf of our stars, our guests and sponsors, welcome to another hour in the Lux Radio Theater. There is no better, easier way of keeping your complexion soft, smooth, and clear than through the daily use of Lux Toilet Soap. It's not surprising, then, that nine out of ten of the screen's loveliest stars protect their complexions with Lux Toilet Soap. What is surprising is that a large cake of this pure white soap costs only a few cents, so little that every girl can use Hollywood's favorite beauty care every day. Remember to buy a supply tomorrow. Thank you. And now, our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Of all the precepts in the Bible, I have found none more pleasant to observe than love thy neighbor. It's not as much to my credit, however, as it is to theirs. For the neighbors in my case happen to be those charming people, Lily Pons and Mr. and Mrs. Adolphe Monjou. Last year, I rode across the country on the same train with Miss Pons. At that time, her dog was recovering from an operation. Ordinary dogs get nothing more aristocratic than fleas. A prima donna's dog gets appendicitis. As we stopped at each station, the daintiest singer of them all would favor me with a dazzling smile. The result was that I lifted her dog on and off the train all the way from New York to Hollywood. <laughs> Presenting Adolf Manjou as Duke Paul is particularly appropriate. For when I first met him, he was known as the Duke. Because, though he may have owed for board and lodging... His first day's pay from each production went as a down payment on another suit of clothes. A Manjou performance today is as brilliant as a Manjou sport jacket, and that's saying something. Tonight, Lady Julia is Marjorie Gateson, and Lord Shear will be enacted by George Saunders. Miss Pons is heard as Melanie, a cafe singer and acrobat. And now, Noel Coward's conversation piece, starring Lily Pons and Adolf Manjou. The play begins in Paris during the year 1809. We're in a small, shabby cafe called Le Petit Girondin. The hour is late, but the cafe is filled with a drinking, boisterous crowd. <laughs> At a tiny window, seeking relief from the tobacco-laden air, stands the perfect gentleman of the time, Duke Paul, conspicuous in that crowd for his elegant attire and obvious refinement. He has just been joined by Melani, Exquisitely fresh and untouched. Melanie, too, is quite unlike the others. Monsieur, you have come too early. I cannot leave until I sing again. I am impatient to start our new life, mademoiselle. Do you have to juggle your wine barrels, too? No, no more tricks. Just one song and I will be finished here for the night. Finished here for good, Melanie? Yes, for good. But you seem gloomy about it. No, but I... I'm in a daze. I'm so afraid I am dreaming. It is really true, all this? Or will I just wake up? Oh, it's quite true. One more turn and you are done with cabarets, finished with tricks, wine barrels, and squalor. But anyone would be in a daze with all this smoke in here. The window is open. Shall we leave out together? Then we can breathe and see the stars? Well, let's breathe by all means. Oh, bright it is tonight. Do you have enough room? Well, it's a tight squeeze. Yes, but cozy. Hmm? Come now. Back to business. You realize that when you sing your last note tonight, Melanie of the Cabarets will be no more. Yes. And you will leave here with me as Melanie de Tramont. Who has never been in a cabaret in her life. Exactly. Who was a sweet, fair-haired little girl in an old gray chateau with a walled garden. Yes, excellent, mademoiselle. And whose parents died in the revolution when she was very young. I will remember, monsieur. 
You will live for the time being with that nice old lady we called upon. She believes that you are my guardian? Yes. And that I am the doctor of your dear old friend, the Marquis de Tramont? Yes, she suspects nothing. I'm so glad. It is very flattering to be taken for a Marquis's daughter. You must see that you learn to act like one. You must be very careful of your speech, your manners, your whole attitude. I will teach you, and I promise to be as patient as I can. I'm sorry to be so much trouble. It is a question of business, not trouble. As you are now, almost any man would admire you extravagantly. <laughs> but no rich man would believe that you were the daughter of a marquis and marry you. And if no rich man married you, you could never pay me your rich commission. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because here we are, stargazing, while you dictate a new life for us. And all year, we can go. We have never seen each other. We are not stargazing. We are talking business. Uh, oh, now, but, but still, the night is all blue, and here I am, a singing acrobat. Unknown and penniless, squeezed in a dusty window with you, a great deal. Equally penniless and middle-aged. Oh, no, not middle-aged. Well, getting on, then. A little bit, so nice to me. Look here, mademoiselle, you are talking nonsense. I'm sorry. You are not in the least sorry. Oh, monsieur. If you were, your eyes wouldn't shine like bonfires. My eyes? Put them out. Yes, monsieur. Well, that's better. And no more sentiment, please. Our new life is a sensible business partnership, strictly. Yes, I know. That is agreed. Even a great duke must eat. And the revolutionaries left me nothing but those few pictures I told you about, which they somehow overlooked. So, you are my only possible business asset. You always come back to business. But naturally. We will live on in Paris, as I say, on the little I have saved. I will be a very frugal. Then, when we are ready, perhaps something will turn up. Enough money to take us to England and a rich and doting husband for you. I see. England is where we will catch him. Melanie, Melanie, come here. I'm sorry, they are calling me. I have to squeeze back now and sing. All right, your last song, mademoiselle. I choose it carefully. A fitting swan song? No, not a swan song. It is a promise. Listen to it, please. Because it is about someone rather like me who promised that she will not betray you and destroy your plans, but who will follow her secret heart, no matter what stars is pay, until she finds love. You come here. I don't know. This nasty ship keeps fish pushy about me. I'm crashed from the waves, and the wind is shocking me. Where are you? Here, by the railing. Oh, quick one, catch me. Here, hold on. Are you all right? No, I'm miserable. What do you want? Look, off there, those lights. Yes, what there are? Melanie, those lights are England. England? 
Are you sure? Of course. <laughs> it was like a rock. Two years we have been waiting for this moment, and now we're here. No, quite. Oh. Think what it means, Melanie. We have enough money left from the few pictures I sold to keep us going properly for three months. And you are changed into a perfect aristocrat. Not perfect enough to fool your friends. Who? That woman. We were here on the boat. Lady Julia. I think she suspects. Nonsense. Lady Julia couldn't possibly suspect. You are an aristocrat. And there is England teeming with rich men. It doesn't look it. We have only one handicap left. You're English. Don't worry. It is coming. Yes, at a snail's pace. Once in England, you will speak only English. Oui, Paul. The solicitor who engaged your little house in Brighton has also engaged a maid for you who cannot speak one word of French. Her name is Rose. Rose? I think she will be a thorn. Good morning, Monsieur Le Duc. Good morning, Rose. You're bright and early, sir. I told you I would be today to go over Mademoiselle's bills for the month. I have them all ready for you on Mademoiselle's desk. Thank you. And how is Mademoiselle's English this morning? I don't know, sir. But my French is improving by leaps and bounds. I see. There seems to be a lot of veal on this butcher's bills. I keep telling Mademoiselle that it's unreliable. It's not its integrity, I question, but its cost. What is this bill here? Oh, that uh, humbug, sir. Huh? They're sort of big bullseyes. Bullseyes? Ooh, not real ones, sir. Uh, they're sweet, candy. You tuck one in your cheek and it keeps you going for hours. Mademoiselle's very partial to them. Good morning, Melanie. <laughs> oh, mon Dieu, personne ne m'a dit. English, Melanie, English. Oh, I did not know you were here. That will be all now, Rose. Thank you, sir. Melanie, what on earth is that lump on your cheek? Uh, Umbug. They are delicious. Paul, are you mad again? You have been speaking French to Rose and eating too much veal. Please, I'm sorry. Veal is unreliable and expensive. You are eating too many sweets, and unless you learn English quickly, we shall have to go away, just as we came, without money, without position, without anything. Please, do not be angry with me this morning. It is my birthday. Again? Well, I feel like my birthday. How can I make you realize that life is serious? Look at these bills. We've been in Brighton a month. Yes, And Paul. nothing has happened at all. Allo, what will you have me do? I have no food, I have no clothes, go out into the street in rags and say, marry me, marry me to every man I see, or come with that fascist matin. English? Zut. You must. Listen, I will be sensible, even in English. I will try to be sensible, but you must not ask me to be serious. This adventure must be getting funny. That's because today you feel particularly happy without reason, just yes. as yesterday you felt miserable without reason. You are a creature entirely without balance. I was an acrobat one. Kindly remember that you spent your lisping, carefree childhood in the walled garden of an old gray chateau feeding swans. What is lisping? Never mind. You have never even seen an acrobat, let alone been one. Now then, business, Melanie. What did Lord Shear say to you last night? Not very much, but he was very ardent. He's coming here this morning. This morning? I wrote him a little note from you. I will receive him, and when I have talked to him for a little, he will propose marriage. When he does... You will accept him. When may I love somebody, please? Love has nothing to do with our agreement. I see. What's the matter? It doesn't feel like my birthday anymore. Please, Melanie, no sentiment. And what if I fell in love? Fell in love? Yes, yes, what if I fell in love? But why all this talk of love? I tell you, it has nothing to do with our agreement. But what if I could not help it, in spite of your agreement? Then we could have to go away and start all over again. Now, please stop talking nonsense. It is not nonsense. You are so sure that everything in life can be arranged so like arithmetic. But why not? Emotion is so very untidy. That is how you feel. Exactly. Very well. I will see our young lord here, but I have no forgotten my promise, Pop. Promise? That last night at a cafe to follow my secret heart. Good morning, mademoiselle. Good morning, Lord Cheer. I've uh, just been having a talk with your guardian. Oh, yes? He said I might see you. Oh, it, uh, it is a very nice day. It is not. Very nice. So pretty. Everything here in England is so fresh and clean. Look out there. 
Out of the window. That little boat. How do you say? Sail, sailboat? Yes, that's a sailing boat. So graceful in the sunshine. Like a white butterfly. Yes. Melanie, I, I had no idea you had a... A, a god? Yes. He, he said that he understands I want to marry you. Did he? Melanie, I didn't know. When I spoke to you last night, I wasn't sure of what I wanted. I'm not sure now, but don't you... But you speak so quickly. Please do not speak so quickly. Why do you stare at me? Who are you, really? I am Melanie de Tramont, the daughter of the Marquis de Tramont. My father was killed in the revolution. My mother also, and my little brother, Armand, and... And your and... four other brothers and four sisters. I know all that. Your guardian told me. Oh. A large family. Very large. You love them? Yes, they are very large. And your guardian, you love him? Yes. I see. Uh, uh, the father. Hmm. Who are you, really? Oh, go away. Who are you? I don't know. I... Oh, please. I love you, Melanie. No, no. It's true. It feels strange, as though I weren't quite awake. And yet, at the same time, more awake than I've ever been before. You see, I'm not very old, not very experienced yet, and... Well, it's the first time. Oh, this is very uneasy. Why? Didn't you expect it? No, no, like this. You wanted me to love you, didn't you? Both you and your, your guardian? No, you no. You see, I'm not quite so young as all that. Not quite a fool. My eyes are wide open. Well, there's a lot I don't understand. A trick, some sort of trick. I feel it with all my instincts, but I don't care. I feel more than that. I feel that you're very lovely and very sweet. And that's enough. Will you please, please be my wife? Leave me. I beg of you. Don't hide Leave your face me. in your hands. Look at me. No, no. Melanie... Go away, please, please, go away. In just a moment, we will continue with conversation piece starring Lily Pons and Adolf Marju. Now, let's pay a visit to a typical Hollywood home. The family's sitting down to a six o'clock dinner, but we'll go upstairs and tune in on Anne, the pretty daughter of the house. Here she is. Gee, I would get stuck on the lot just when I have a date. No, I'm terribly late. I'm so tired. I hate to go out with Bill when I feel like this. Oh, but three cheers. I've got a good idea. Luckily, Anne knows a secret she learned from movie stars. And half an hour later, listen to what she says. I'll say that Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath makes a girl come too. I'm ready for a large evening now. I'm dancing on air. And what a fragrance that nice soap has. I feel like a million. Bill's got to think I look it. A Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath is soothing, refreshing. Its active lather is so thorough that it removes from your pores stale perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt. That's why it keeps neck and back and shoulders soft and clear. Why it protects daintiness, leaves skin sweet. That's why lovely screen stars like Loretta Young, Carol Lombard, Anita Louise use it. And why you're sure to like it. Try this luxurious, inexpensive beauty bath tomorrow. And now, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Conversation Piece, starring Lily Pons... And Adolf Manjou with Marjorie Gateson and George Saunders. It's several days later. In the little house in Brighton, Melanie waits eagerly for Paul to pay his daily visit. At the sound of a footstep, she turns quickly. But it's only Charles, the servant. Mademoiselle. Yes, Charles? There's a lady and gentleman to see you, mademoiselle. Who are they? The Duke and Duchess of Benedon. The Duke and Duchess? Lord Cheers, Parrot? Yes, mademoiselle. Where are they, Charles? In the sitting room, mademoiselle. Thank you. I will go and see them. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You are mademoiselle de Tremont? Oui. I am the Duchess of Benedon, and my husband, the Duke. Monsieur? Uh, how do you do? Please forgive us for calling on you so, so unexpectedly. But I believe you are acquainted with my son, Lord Shah. One moment, uh, my love. Uh, don't rush, madam. If you please, Frederick. Yes, my love. Won't you sit down to check? Oh, thank you. As I said before, I believe you are acquainted with my son. You are come to ask a service? Um, yes, mademoiselle. We have. Then I do not understand the chest. Uh, your manner is so impolite. Oh, uh, my wife is upset. Naturally upset. Why? Well, uh, Edward is our only son. Is that not more your fault than mine? Uh, uh, it's uh, no uh, use banding words, Frederick, and wasting time. Mademoiselle, my son is infatuated with you. 
But he's young, and that infatuation will not last. It must not last. My husband and I are fully prepared to compensate you within reason. Yes. Compensate? What is that, compensate? Money. Money? You will pay me money? Yes, if you will give, give us your word that you will never see my son again. If I love him, what then? That is beside the point. I think you will perhaps go now. Five hundred pounds. It is very charming, your son, and his eyes are very clear and blue. I think you will be angry. A thousand pounds. I'm tired, madame. I cannot sit down until you go. Excuse me if I read my mail. I would rather like to make one thing clear to you. Uh, Georgie, Anna. Quiet. Oh, oh. If my son marries without his parents' consent, he will not have a penny. Not a penny. Do you understand that? Georgiana, please. You rang, mademoiselle? Yes, Rose. The Duke and Duchess are leaving. Uh, come, Georgiana. Come, my dear. My maid will show you out. It will not be necessary. Good afternoon. <laughs> Rose, quick, Sam Sherry. My legs will not stand. My goodness, her face when she went out. My goodness, her face all the time. Oh, Rose. How oh, my heart bleeds for her poor, poor husband. <laughs> I beg pardon, mademoiselle. There's a lady to see you. What? Another one? Lady Julia Chartres. She says she met you on the boat coming over. Oh, that one? I do not wish to see her. Tell her I'm far, far away. Yes, mademoiselle. Good afternoon. Oh, please forgive me, but it was so drafty in the hall. Oh, yes. That will be all, Charles. Yes, mademoiselle. Will you sit down? Thank you. I fear that Monsieur Le Duc is not here. Yes, I know. It was you I wished to see. I've recently come to Brighton, and I've been so wanting to see you again. I'm very happy, madame. I have so much to talk to you about. Your guardian and I spent a great deal of our childhood together in France, you know. That is very nice. It was such a pleasant surprise to see him again on the boat. I had thought he was dead. No, he's alive. Mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> I knew your father many years ago, the Marquis de Tramont. Yes? Oh, a most witty and delightful man. Yes, he was very nice. I, uh... I don't remember that he had any children. Oh, yes, too. One boy and one girl. I was the girl. Oh? <laughs> where, where did you live when you were a child? A great wild chateau near Bordeaux. It's all very distant in my mind. Mm, the uh, Chateau de Tramont, no doubt. Yes. There was a small water and swan. I spent all my early years lisping there. Oh? <laughs> well, you haven't got a list now. No, I lost it in the revolution. You, uh, you remember very little about your early life. It is so far away. Uh, so very far away from the truth. Madame! Oh, my dear child, don't be absurd. The whole story is idiotic. You've been very badly rehearsed. <laughs> Paul should be ashamed of himself. I do not understand what you speak, oh, madame. Oh, nonsense. And I do not understand why you come here. I came to find out what you were like. To see what sort of plaything Paul had picked out for himself. Plaything? I am not plaything. Oh, come, come. You can hardly expect me to believe that. How dare you speak those words to me? Oh, there's no necessity for you to lose your temper, my dear. How dare you? Leave here at once. At once, do you hear? Paul, Paul! What in the world? Oh, Julia, I didn't know you were coming. Tell her to go away at once. Tell her, Paul. Melanie, be careful. No, enough of being careful. Enough of this English busy body. <laughs> I congratulate you, Paul. She's a fine spirit. My dear Julia, what has happened? I have been insulted. Insulted? Yes. First, by the very charming mother of Lord Shear, and now by this snooping camel. Melanie, Lady Julia is a very old friend. But she has no the right to come here and call me your plaything. What? Yes, your plaything, to my face. I will not stand for you taking that tone. You want me to marry Lord Shear, do you? Very well. But after, you will have no penny, not one, and I shall be forced to do tricks again. Melanie de Tramont in the cabaret? That will be charming. And a lot of good it will do you. This is idiotic. It is, it is. And I will not stand anymore. Not for you. Not for the love of heaven. I'm going back to France. Tomorrow. If I have swim there. It's <laughs> all so very interesting, Paul. It was unkind of you to come here and bully the child. I didn't bully her. I merely wanted to find out who she was. I see. Well, it's an odd story, Julia. Quite fantastic, in fact. May I hear it? If you wish. First, I should like to speak to Melanie for a moment. Do you mind? Not at all. 
I'll be here when you come back. Thanks. I won't be long. Melanie. Melanie. Yes. Come here. I want to speak to you. Yes. Melanie, why did you speak like that in front of Lady Julia? I hate her. That's quite beside the point. Don't you realize that if you persist in treating people as you do, that our plans, the work of two years, will be for nothing? I say I was going back to France. Yes, but you don't mean that. I do. Oh, Paul, let me go. I will never be happy here. Let me go. And you come with me. I? Well, no, Melanie. My life is here. And yours, too, if you would only realize it. You do not care about whether I am happy? You can be just as happy here as in France, alone. But when I married, when you have found me a rich man, I will be alone here, too. You will have your husband. I will have his money. It's a good compensation. Is, is that all that love means to you? Is there nothing else? I've told you, business and sentiment don't mix. Now dry your eyes, Melanie, and try to be cheerful. I'll speak to you later. Where are we going? I'm going to call a carriage and take Lady <laughs> Julia home. I'll have a good deal to explain on the way. Must you go? I'm afraid I must. Goodbye, Melanie. Oh, Paul! Paul! There you have it, Julia. You see, Melanie is nothing to me. She is my plan, my trick to be played upon the world, my livelihood. Paul, have you gone mad? No. I have merely transformed myself from an effete aristocrat into an unscrupulous adventurer. That sounds faintly theatrical. The murder of my wife and child was theatrical enough. The deaths of my whole family on the guillotine were equally theatrical. My life, from then onwards, as a fugitive, 
was an endless succession of serial comic stage effects. I was a baker's assistant, a lawyer's clerk, a tutor. Two years ago, I found Melanie singing in a cafe. She seemed to me to be better material than my sibling pupils. And five months ago, I managed to sell two pictures from the old house. With that money, I brought her here. Why? She used to make a rich marriage. And you take the commission? Yes. Well? Well, I think it's a good joke. In very bad taste. Taste is too expensive a social luxury for a poor man. Mm, I suppose the poor little thing is in love with you. In love with me? What nonsense. This whole plan has been understood completely between us from the first as a business arrangement. How wise. Will you help me? Well, I'll try. I knew you would. Bring her to my house. When? This evening. This evening? Mm -hmm, If she'll come. I think she might if I ask her to. Sit down, Melanie. Thank you. Melanie, I have brought you here for a very good purpose. But first, I wish you would apologize to Lady Julia. No, no, it's for me to say I'm sorry. I was over inquisitive and I jumped at conclusions too hastily. Mademoiselle, I ask your forgiveness. Thank you, Melanie. I have told Lady Julia everything. She has promised to help us. It's a very interesting story, Mademoiselle. And I should like the help to bring it to a happy ending. We can talk quite freely in front of Lady Julia. That is very nice. Oh, well, come now, to business. Business? Oh, yes. In the first place... Who do you know? Not one of important. Melanie, Lord Shear is our only definite proposal so far. Do you like him, Mademoiselle? Melanie, will you kindly concentrate? Oh, I do see how difficult it must be for one so young and so charming to banish sentiment entirely. You are sympathetic, Madame, but sentiment is very silly. There is no sentiment in the whole world really enough to waste the time upon. Paul has spoken that very often. Let us now then make business. I have a number with which to begin. A number? Yes, I make the progress. First, there is the Prince Regent. But he will not marry me. Melanie. Not be shocked, Paul. That is true. And we are speaking truth. <laughs> Admirable. Then, there is Lord Shear. He loves me. Excellent. But if we marry, there is not money at all. Oh, that can soon be remedied if your social position is improved. You must first of all be presented, more or less informally, here at the pavilion. But how? Who will present us? I shall, but before that, you must give a little supper party. Now, I'll arrange it and invite the guests. I can never begin to express my gratitude, Julia. Oh, not at all. Old friends must be kept from starving. Now, let me see. Lord St. Mary's must come, and the Duke and Duchess of Denedon, and Lord Shear, Lady Mosscrock, and, of course, the Earl and Countess of Harringford. Oh, they're very useful. Are uh, they rich? Are they foolish sons? Melanie. Well, you must have cards and good wine. <clears throat> now, perhaps some music. Mademoiselle might sing a little. She has such a charming voice, but I should suggest songs more allied to the classics than the cabaret. A very profitable suggestion. It is not false. Be very sure, madame, that we'll choose my songs with care, and I will be so careful to live up to them, to cheat and lie and pretend perfectly. Oh, yes. I will be so very careful, Paul, to follow Madame's suggestion. And my secret heart. Your secret heart? Yes, Madame. No matter what price is paid, what stars may fade above, I'll follow my secret heart. for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Conversation piece starring Lily Pons as Melanie and Adolf Monjou as Duke Paul continues shortly from the Lux Radio Theater. When the 1933 All-American football team was selected, practically every sports writer in the country picked Cotton. Cotton Warburton, the diminutive quarterback of the University of Southern California. Since graduation, he's been at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, where he's now a film editor. I've asked him here tonight to tell us something about editing films and scoring touchdowns. All right, Cotton, kick off. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. First, I'd better explain what a film editor does. It's very seldom, ladies and gentlemen, that a picture is filmed in the same continuity as you see it on the screen. 
The middle part may be taken first. The first part may go before the camera last. All this must be joined in its proper sequence and music and sound effects injected. Cutting is a major problem. In the good earth, for example, two and one-half million feet of film were shot, enough for 200 pictures. It's our job to cut the good earth to 12,000 feet. You know, Mr. DeMille, I thought I was through with football when I went in the picture business, but I'm still calling signals. Take this, for example. 25D, F38762, scene 28A, take 3, date 106. Well, let's call time out while you explain that to the audience. We use signals in referring to a certain piece of film. That particular number refers to the third version of a scene from The Good Earth, showing Paul Muni eating a bowl of rice. Those numbers also reveal what sequence the scene is in and on what date it was filmed. But unfortunately, I can't use the same method of keeping my signals straight as I did in college. How did you do it there? I had them neatly written down on my pants. <laughs> One time, the manager sent my regular pants to the cleaner, and I almost lost the next game. <laughs> Have you played any football, Cotton, since you received your diploma? No, though I coached a professional team owned by Victor McLaughlin. But since I married and became a papa, I get all the exercise I need walking the floor. Does the baby look like all American material? Not unless football teams are going to include girls, but she's a 100% Lux baby, Mr. DeMille. And then at least she'll have an all-American complexion. Right. I don't, know how, I don't know much about the care or feeding of babies, but I figured if Lux soap is pure and gentle enough for the stars, it must be about the best on the market. When the doctor backed me up on that, I felt pretty proud of myself. If you were picking the All-American team for this season, Cotton, whom would you select? From performances to date, my choice would be Borans, King, Minnesota, and Kelly Yale. For tackles, Widseth, Minnesota, and Franco Fordham. For guards, Pierce Fordham and Morell Navy. For center, Herwig, California. For halfbacks, Heap Northwestern and Urim, Minnesota. For quarterback, Smith of Alabama. And for fullback, Patrick Pittsburgh. And before I have time to change my mind, thank you and so long. Good night. We return to our story, Conversation Piece, starring Lily Pons and Adolph Monju, with Marjorie Gateson and George Saunders. It's the evening of Melanie's official presentation. In a room fairly glittering with social celebrities, the young girl appears nervous and excited. She's been asked to sing, and as our scene opens, she is just finishing her song. know what I mean. Yes, her background is a bit, uh, well, shady, don't you think, Lady Harrington? Hmm, I wish we could find out more about her. Well, I'm going to ask. You can't be too careful these days about the people you meet. Since Lady Julia was the one who presented her, perhaps she will give us a little information. <laughs> Melanie, you were wonderful. Thank you, Lady Julia. Come with me now. I want you to meet Lady Worth and Lady Harrington. Please, no more. I have met so many people. I have all confused. Confused? But... You ask me questions. All of them ask me questions. I'm so tired of them. If anyone asks me another question, I shall scream. Melanie, control yourself. I can't. Melanie, Melanie, what's the matter? She can't meet any more guests. But she must. Then you tell her. I have other things to do. I'm tired, Paul. Let me go. Let me meet some other time. Sometime will happen if you don't. But nonsense. Everyone is captivated by you. You're a success. On the surface, yes. But underneath, they suspect me and they hate me. I can't feel it. Be quiet. Oh, Paul. May we have the pleasure of meeting your very charming ward? But of course. Lady Harrington and Lady Worth, my ward, Melanie de Tremont. Sure. So please, my dear. Thank you. Uh, de Tremont, uh, the Marquis, I presume. Yes, he was my guardian's friend. Oh, of course, of course. It's so stupid of me, Paul. Not at all. You sing beautifully, my dear. Wherever did you study? Why? 
in France? And of what teacher? Why, I don't. A private teacher, Lady Worth, unknown but very efficient. Uh, he must have been. Oh, uh, Paul, may I see you? Uh, certainly. Excuse me, please. Of course. I'll be back directly. Oh. Perhaps I had best to go to I. Oh, no, 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 please. Uh, we uh, have so much to ask you, mademoiselle. Yes, uh, about the revolution. Yes, I, uh, I would rather not talk about it, if you don't mind. Uh, then we shall talk about something else. Please. I would rather not talk about anything. My dear, are you ill? Yes, I'm very ill. Strange. Lady Bromley said you were ill just before. <laughs> uh, when she asked you something about your life. What do you mean by that? We mean, my dear, <laughs> that you seem to be particularly averse to discussing your past. Lady Harrington. It's true. Yes, it is true. All of you have been snooping so hard to find out something about me. You wish to tell all your friend and make joke. Well, I will explain to you. Listen, I am the daughter of a Mandarin in China. He was my first father. My second father was a Turk in Prague. He lived in Spain. I live in Italy. My mother was a slave. My brothers and sisters were slaves. No, they were little pigs trying with their big noses to find out things like you, madame, and you. Oh, I never heard of you. I am Goethe Snipe. I am the daughter of a witch who was burnt at the stake. Take these tales to your friend, but take these quickly. Because if you don't know, go away and leave me alone, I will smash your painted face and pull your dead hair on by the roots. Oh, I think we have heard enough. I'm only sorry the rest of the company didn't hear it also. They will soon enough. Tell them, tell them all, and then get out. All of you, get out, get out! <laughs> Paul, where are you? I am here. Lie quietly, Melanie. Oh, what happened, Paul? You fainted. You'll be all right now. Oh, yes, I remember. All the people. They are gone. Thanks to you, yes. Oh, Paul, I... I'm sorry. Why did you do it? I don't know. I asked you to let me go. You did it deliberately, didn't you? No, Paul, I swear. You wanted it to happen. All along, you wanted it. Yes, I did. You've ruined everything. I hope you realize that. Yes, but... But I don't care. Let them go. Let them leave us. I won't want to marry. I don't want. I can't. It, it's you I love, Paul. What? It's you. I love you, Paul. That is why I have been so happy. Melanie, this is a farce. Is it farce to be loved to me? But there can be no love between us. It's not only a farce, it's madness. Oh, no. It is only a very simple truth. You have broken your word, you have lied, and you have made me ridiculous, a fool. <laughs> that is the simple truth. And you, in all your clever plans, did you once think of me? Never. All that was understood between us from the beginning. You knew everything, and you agreed to everything. I could not answer for my heart. Your heart? I love you, do you understand? Call me mad. Say it is all stupid romantic, if that will quite your conscience. My conscience is not troubled. But it's true, and I love you deep. In all my life, no other things have been so deep in me. You were finished with love when your wife was killed. How often you have spoken to me of that. Melanie, I beg of you. And because there was a revolution, you think to scheme over all life, secure. You think to fit everyone to your plans like puppets. But life is real, Paul. It is important, and life is too strong in me to be just a puppet. I was a fool to trust you. I love you. I love you. And you too, deep down in my heart, you love me. Yes, Paul. Everything shouted to me. You think now, because you stand here so bitter, with the door open to go, that you will prove me wrong, that you are secure in your shell. I know that too. But you must not go, Paul. Please. Oh, Paul. Come back, Paul. Come back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to announce to you the return to Le Petit Girardin of Mademoiselle Melanie. Oh, Melanie. Mademoiselle Melanie returns with her bewitching voice for your delight and her acrobatic tricks on her elusive wine barrels for your amazement. 
Tonight, she will first delight you with a little song. She will amaze you later. I present Mademoiselle Melanie. <laughs> Melanie. Melanie. Oh! Why are you here in France? <laughs> Thank God you're all right. To be with you, I came, that's all. We can't talk here. Come with me, quick. Oh, Melanie. Here. Here is a little window in the shadow. This one. It will squeeze us to look out, but we will be less conspicuous. All right. How did you know? Where to find you now, Cheer? I asked Lady Julia and Rose for everything they knew. I had to find you if only to see that you were all right. They told you everything? Yes, between them. I made them. So you... Do you understand now? Yes, I understand. Then, why are you here? I love you. But... I know. But I... I had to tell you, Melanie. There is only room for one true love in my heart. My secret heart. I understand. I see you. The stars are thick tonight. You're not looking at them. I see them in your eyes. They are flooded with stars. I'm sorry. No, do not be ashamed of these tears. They are fine and manly. See, I keep them. Oh, thank you, my dear, for being so sweet to me. Melanie, you don't know how I've longed to kiss you. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, mon Dieu, Paul, you hear too? Yes, I was worrying about you. This is an unexpected pleasure, Lord Shear. And how do you do? Worrying? I see now there was no need. But when I went back to your house and found you gone... You went back? The day after. I did not know Lord Shear was with you, and naturally I felt a responsibility. However, it was plain when I interrupted you just now that you have returned to reason. Yes, Paul. 
Lord Shear, I congratulate you. Oh, but... Uh, uh, yes, Father. It's so pretty to see youth in love. Please, keep our looking. Mm, I, I have a brandy at the table. Uh, if you'll... Ex- please excuse me, I'll wait there. Shall we lean out of the window, Paul? With pleasure. It's still dusty, I see. Yes, Paul. You are going to marry? Yes, Paul. I'm very glad. Yes, Paul. You're in love? Yes, Paul. So am I. Yes, Paul. What is the matter with you? Can you say nothing else but yes, Paul? No, there is nothing else to say. When are you going to be married? Soon, very soon. What about money? That will no matter. Never does. Have you anything to reproach me with? No. Well, then, there is really nothing else except this. What and is... Wh- one other thing. What is this? Oombugs, your favorite candies. Oh, Paul, please open them. And other things. It's all true what you said, Melanie. I do love you. There, they're open. And if you want an oombug now... Yes, please. I love you desperately, with all my heart. And I know now that I can never prove you wrong. Ouch! What is it? My muscles. They are not used to acrobatics. So, Melanie, you are going to marry Lord Shear after all. Certainly not. I'm going to marry you, my darling. Melanie. Wait. Business now. I must go this moment and amaze the clientele with some tricks. Quick, another humbug. Never mind. Business can wait. What was that in your song? No matter what price is paid, what stars may fade above, Upon singing the lovely melody, I follow my secret heart, the curtain descends on conversation peace. But we shall hear further from Miss Pons and Adolf Manjou a little later. Before introducing our next guest, we make a statement furnished by Mr. Melvin Purvis, our guest on last week's program. Quote, after stating figures on crime, it was discovered that the number of murders committed in Memphis in 1935 was 103 instead of the figure given. I desire to express my genuine and sincere regret for this inadvertence, unquote. I join Mr. Purvis in offering my regrets for this mistake. As the Ripley of Hollywood, Peg Murray is an encyclopedia of strange truths concerning your favorite stars. In returning to our microphone, he bears the distinction of being the first guest to be called back since the Lux Radio Theater has come to you from Hollywood, proving that you like to listen to his odd facts as much as you like to read his cartoons in the daily paper under the caption, Seeing Stars. I've asked him to begin with what he knows about Lily Pons and Adolf Manjou. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Feg Murray. Thanks, Mr. DeMille. Starting from the ground up, Lily Pons wears the smallest shoes of any star in Hollywood, size one and a half B. A village in Maryland has been named after her, and she originally took up singing as a means of improving her health. Adolf Manjou was a captain in the United States Army Ambulance Service in Italy during the World War. Hollywood told him he was through when the talkies came along, so he made pictures in French, Italian, and Spanish and was so successful that Hollywood did nip-ups trying to get him back. His parrot likewise speaks French, Italian, and English. (laughs) And now, Mr. DeMille, I understand you have an item for me concerning the Plainsman. Yes. Since I began making The Plainsman, 39 different people have written me, each claiming to own Lucretia Borgia, Buffalo Bill's famous rifle. And now what can you tell us about football and Hollywood? Well, Paul Robeson and Jim Thorpe, the Indian, were both All-American players. Barton McLean once ran back a kickoff 105 yards to score a touchdown for Wesleyan. Johnny Mac Brown of Alabama caught the 58-yard pass that beat Washington 10 years ago in the Rose Bowl. Gene Raymond blushes when you mention football. Once in a prep school game, Gene ran the length of the field for a touchdown, only to discover he had galloped in the wrong direction. (laughs) Dolores Del Rio should also be mentioned here. She's never seen a football game. Dolores, who is Gary Cooper's aunt by marriage, doesn't know what she's missed, just like those girls who may never have used Lux toilet soap. 
I think the strangest fact I could find in Hollywood would be a movie star who doesn't use Lux soap. Mm. And here's another fact people may not know. That wonderful aroma in Lux soap comes from 34 different ingredients gathered from the far corners of the earth. Now, suppose I turn you loose with whatever fact you care to give us. Swell. In Lloyd's of London, Freddie Bartholomew eats roast beef that costs $1,502.10. They must have ordered it from a nightclub. The meat itself cost only $2.10. The 1500 was the cost of time lost in getting that roast beef to steam properly for the cameras. Shirley Temple has a life insurance policy which is void if she takes up arms in defense of her country or meets death by accident while intoxicated. <laughs> Lionel Stander, who appeared in 28 Broadway flops in eight years, has one green eye and one brown eye. And speaking of variety, there's a tree on Elisa Landy's estate which bears oranges, lemons, grapefruit, and kumquats, all from the same root. Fred Astaire has spent more than 200 hours dancing on air. In each dance, he's in the air one second out of every five. And there's a card on file in a Hollywood studio which turned Fred down with the following notation at the bottom. A stare also dances. <laughs> Any more inside information? Just one more fact, and this is strictly from the inside. Warner Baxter's appendix is on his left side instead of his right. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> if the statement of Dr. Samuel Johnson is true, that a Frenchman must always be talking, tonight's stars must have felt at home in a play whose title is Conversation Piece. Miss Pons was born in southern France, while Mr. Monjou, a native of Pittsburgh, is the son of a Frenchman. They now resume the conversation. Mademoiselle Pons, Monsieur Monjou. Uh, don't forget that uh, you're partly French yourself, Mr. Dumel. Yeah, but I'm not the boulevardier. You are, Monsieur Monjou. Thank you. Why don't you foreigners talk English like me? I know. I've only a little accent. <laughs> I wasn't always such a fine speaker of English. It's very hard to learn. So many words. You spell them almost like but you pronounce them so much different. I once made up a, a poem about it. You like to me to recite, Mr. We'd Demille? be delighted, Miss Barnes. Very well. I recite. If L-A-U-G-H spells la and B-O-U-G-H spells go, surely C-A-U-G-H is ca and C-O-U-G-H is cow. If bread is made of substance known as dough, was the steak I have for dinner turf or toe? I still am quite unable, as I got up from the table, to be sure if I was turf or through or through. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. And if your dog gets sick again, I suggest you see Mr. Monjou. He knows all about dogs. So? Yes, I raised them, Miss Bones, just as a hobby. Cairns and psylliums. Where do you learn about growing dogs? Well, I, um, I used to work on a farm. I learned quite a bit about livestock before I got into pictures. Excellent training. A foreman told me the other day that the cows have gone so high hat, they refuse to be washed down unless the farmhands use Lux toilet soap. Who can blame them? <laughs> All beautiful ladies use Lux soap. But why did you want to be a farmer? Well, I wanted some nice secluded place in the country with plenty of sunshine and fresh air where I could cultivate a mustache and get into pictures. But now, Miss Pons, before the people are sure Dr. Johnson was right about the French, let us say good night. <laughs> good night, everyone. I hope you like our play. <laughs> good night, Mademoiselle. Good night, Miss Pons, Miss Manjou, our thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick. Mr. DeMille returns shortly with news of next week's show. Mr. Manjou's next picture is titled One in a Million. Miss Pons appeared through courtesy of RKO Studios, where she just completed That Girl from Paris. Mr. DeMille, through courtesy of Paramount... Mr. Warburton, Metro Golden Mayor, and Mr. Lewis Silvers, 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new picture, Lloyd's of London. And here's Mr. DeMille. The story of Louis Pasteur recently provided the screen with one of the finest and most dramatic films ever made. Its success, however, was largely due to the magnificent performance of Paul Muni in the title role. Next week in the Lux Radio Theater, Paul Muni recreates the character of the great French chemist and humanitarian once again. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Paul Muni in the story of Louis Pasteur, assisted by an all-star cast. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.